administrator of America's Lend-Lease Plan reports personally to President Roosevelt, gives facts and figures that can be revealed on what the United States is doing to aid her allies. He tells of the vast shipments of food, tools, machinery, and weapons of all kinds. How America is sending more and more merchandise to those who have allied themselves with the United Nations. He tells how 3,000 planes and motors, some 4,000 tanks, have been shipped to the Soviet Union over the northern route alone. How American planes and tanks helped turn the tide for the victorious British in Egypt. Yes, huge quantities of America's war output have already gone overseas, and more is on the way. Canada's newest light bomber, called the Mosquito, is shown to the public for the first time. Air Force officers are keenly interested. Built of wood, it's said to outmaneuver and outdistance many fighter planes now in action. Test pilot de Havilland, son of the famous designer, takes it along. Speed and range, a military secret, the Mosquito is said to be the fastest bomber in the world. Even when flying on only one of its powerful twin motors, Canada's Mosquito bomber carries a deadly sting. The United States Army has a new and radical little plane, too. Designed to go wherever ground troops can go, it needs remarkably little space to take off. And it climbs like a shot. Carrying pilot and an observer or cameraman, the ship is highly maneuverable and invaluable for reconnaissance. Capable of landing on almost any field, the tiny plane can turn around and get back in the air in a flash. The infantry's newest sky soldier. Proudly, the United States cruiser San Francisco makes port after one of the most heroic naval engagements in history. Challenging a superior force at point-blank range, the San Francisco sank three of Japan's biggest warships. When her admiral was killed on the bridge, this young officer, here with his wife, took command. He brought the ship safely home. Admiral King comes aboard to award the 31-year-old commander the Congressional Medal of Honor. The nation salutes the San Francisco and her gallant crew as they refit the ship and prepare to fight again. Another supply line is open to Alaska. Skagway, famous Klondike port of gold rush days, is in the news again. Ships unloading food and supplies for troops guarding the Arctic outpost. The Yukon Railroad, now operated by the United States Army, heads for a point on the new Alaska Truck Highway. Three engines are needed to make the winding, twisting mountain grade, one of the steepest in the world. Deep in the heart of the Yukon Territory, vital freight is transferred to trucks that travel the new highway to Alaska. American men and motors playing an important role in the development of the Canadian Northwest.
United States High Command, civilian and military, gathers to plan the strategy of war. Unusual, informal pictures of the men who are directing America's global conflict. General Marshall, Army Chief of Staff. Admiral King, Commander of the Fleet. Lunching together, they discuss national problems, foreign and domestic. Admiral William Leahy, the President's own Chief of Staff, sits at the head of the table. Well known in many capitals, Admiral Leahy's last post was that of United States Ambassador to Vichy, France. Admiral Land of the Merchant Navy, General Marshall and Harry Hopkins, the President's personal advisor. On the extreme left, General Arnold, head of the Army Air Force, a flying commander who pilots his own ship and often leads a squadron. White-haired Paul McNutt, civilian head of manpower, with Admiral King and production chief Nelson. Second from the right, Elmer Davis, who now heads the Office of War Information. The High Command planning America's global war. America, fighting a global war, calls on its shipbuilders for vessels of every type and description. Flat-bottom tank carriers, designed for shallow work near shore, go down the ways in record numbers. At one plant, six are built in the same dry dock, launched together by the simple means of flooding the dock. Built to navigate in war zones, to enable American tanks to roll ashore under their own power, the most effective invasion craft afloat. And here is one of the miracle men of United States shipbuilding, Henry J. Kaiser. With an 81-piece model of the famous Liberty ship, Mr. Kaiser shows how the 10,000-ton vessels are actually constructed. Each part is prefabricated, built at a different plant, and assembled just as the master shipbuilder has done here. Now Mr. Kaiser views his latest achievement, the 10,000-ton Robert E. Perry, built in four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. A world production record beyond the dreams of shipbuilding experts. Down the ways, 90% complete, she'll be ready for service within a week of the day her keel was laid. And as the ship hits the water, the keel for another swings into place. Here is America's answer. It can be done. Somewhere in the Pacific, an American carrier drops anchor, puts out anti-submarine nets, and gives the crew time out to relax from the strain of war. Right now, the nets are more of a protection from sharks than torpedoes. Diving 70 feet from the top deck is good enough for an Olympic athlete, disproving the old adage that sailors can't swim. Up the anchor chain, they scamper like youngsters on a holiday. Welcome interlude after long months at battle stations. Now she steams back into action. Planes clustered on her decks. A destroyer that has picked up three of her pilots comes alongside. There's no stopping, for these are dangerous waters. And the transfer is made by Breach's boy while both ships are underway. Eager hands bring the aviators aboard. Three more lucky pilots snatched from the sea. 